Well, can I begin by welcoming you all to the first uh, meeting of Leicester Exchanges, a series of live debates uh, that have been organised by the University of Leicester in order to look at the way in which academic research interacting with policy and practice can engage in groups of people debating prominent issues of the time. So among the issues that might be considered across the series would be topics like, is Britain broken? Why support the arts? Is investment required in fundamental science to make Britain truly international? And this evening, should we punish or reform offenders? My name is Bob Burgess, and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of the University, and it's a great pleasure to have you here this evening in the Tower of London. I hope you're all enjoying the uh, location that has been chosen for this event. Certainly, it is a location that reminds us of the evening's topic, given it, it was used as a prison since at least the year 1100. And among the former prisoners that have been here, so I am told, include William Wallace, Henry VI, Sir Thomas More, Guy Fawkes, Roger Casement and Ru Rudolf Hess. Indeed, I'm also told that Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard and Lady Jane Grey uh, the latter with a Leicester connection, were held and executed here, but I'm uh, guaranteed that this will not happen to you this evening. Now we have four expert panellists, and I'll just go across the front introducing each panellist in turn. Carol Hederman, on my, uh, on my right, is uh, from the University of Leicester and is one of our professors of criminology. Her research interests include the effectiveness of sentencing, rational approaches to sentencing, the, the comparative effectiveness of different approaches to enforcing court penalties, and the broad question of what works in prison and probation. She has previously been a senior civil servant in the Home Office. Blair Gibbs, again to my right, is Head of Crime and Justice Policy at the Think Tank Policy Exchange. Prior to joining Policy Exchange, he worked as Chief of Staff to the Policing and Criminal Justice Minister, Nick Herbert, from 2007 to 2010, and as Campaign Director, uh, campaign director of the Taxpayers' Alliance and as a Home Affairs Researcher at the Reform Think Tank. He read history and politics at Merton College and the University of Oxford. Turning to my left, Mark Johnson is a regular columnist for The Guardian and whose book, Wasted, is a bestseller. Mark has a history of serious crime, homelessness and drug abuse. <laughs> he went through rehabilitation at the age of 29 and since then has become a leading figure in the criminal justice reform movement. Mark is an advisor to local, central and senior government bodies and is a winner of the Pride of Britain Award. He is the founder of User Voice, a charity which seeks to engage those who have experience of the criminal justice system in bringing about its reform and to reduce offending. And then on the far left, Heather Munro is the chief executive of the London Probation Service. She was appointed to this position in August 2010 Heather qualified as a probation officer in 1978 and has worked for a in a variety of locations, including Durham, Hereford and Worcestershire, before moving to Leicestershire in 1981, where she became the chief executive of the probation service in 2004. Well, with that lineup, we have all the expertise, and so at this point, I'll invite each of the panellists to make their opening statement, starting with Carol Hederman. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I hope uh, that you can at least hear me, if not uh, see me at the back. Um, I want us to start by saying uh, something that I think we can all agree on, which is that everybody in this room would like to see the criminal justice system prevent victimisation. Um, all of us would like to see it be more effective in that regard. I think that where some of us might have a slightly different perspective is in the role that punishment plays in preventing offending. And I want to focus particularly on the idea that a taste of custody brings about is either a deterrent or that it reforms people. Uh, I'm sure that quite a few of the people in the room will know that we have 100,000 receptions into custody 
uh, each year or, or there, thereabouts. It's about 93,000, the last statistics. 50,000 of those, so about half of them, or more than half, are for six months or a, a sentence of six months or less. Another 10,000 are for sentences between six to 12 months. So the idea that we're saving uh, imprisonment for the, um, the worst of our offenders is, to my mind, quite questionable. And also, when you look at who gets those short sentences, 76% <clears throat> of short sentences are for uh, nonviolent offences, and that's true of 87% of those on women. So my first question is, do we really need to be using prison that much? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not arguing about the people who are getting more than a year and longer uh, for two reasons. The first is that those people get some probation help on release. And the other thing is that once you get beyond that level of sentence, you're talking about more increasingly serious offenders. Um, the reason that I think that uh, short prison sentences are a bad idea is because they have the worst reconviction rates. They have a worse reconviction rate than longer sentences, uh, longer prison sentences. They have a worse reconviction rate than probation, any sort of probation, community order disposal. Now, of course, the question is, um, and there will be some sentences in the room, um, are the people who get probation the same as the people who go into short um, uh, on, go into prison on short sentences, and they aren't the same people. But there is an overlap between them. And the latest Ministry of Justice analysis that took like for like people, so it controlled for seriousness of offence, number of previous convictions, gender, age, <coughs> those sorts of factors, found that even when you controlled for that, probation was still outperforming short prison sentences. And one of the reasons we have to uh, think about that is to ask why. Why would that be true? And one of the reasons is that all those people on short prison sentences, the, the National Audit Office has shown that they spend an average of six to seven weeks inside. And that is at a cost of about £4,700. And you can get a year on probation for that. So I would expect that if I'm going to get value for money, I would want those short prison sentences to be more effective. But like for like, prison is 7% more effective, which isn't a huge amount, admittedly, but it does show that there is a real difference between um, sending people on a community order versus uh, giving people a short prison sentence. Now, I, one of the reasons that I think this is true is because... The prison service finds it really hard to do anything useful with people in six to seven weeks. That's, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that there's home office research that shows that people who had a job going in don't go out to a job. People who had in accommodation going in do not have an accommodation on, on the way out. And people who had family ties, some sort of social stability before they went in, have lost it by the time they come out of prison. So what I'm suggesting is that we are actually making the chance of victimisation greater. I'm not arguing this on the grounds that I feel sorry for offenders, although it's true that a lot of them are you know, very <coughs> damaged individuals. But what I'm arguing is that we are making more victims by using short prison sentences for some of the people who are currently going on into prison on a short sentence. And we're doing so at a very uh, high cost. Now, that's going to make me sound like uh, I think probation is the best thing since sliced bread. And I do have enormous respect for the probation service. There's no question about it. Uh, I've seen the sorts of work they do, and they do it with the most damaged and difficult people it's possible to imagine, and I'm sure those of you who are censuses will feel the same way as I do about that. Um, I think that probation could be better. Uh, certainly, I think there are a whole range of ways in which uh, community disposals could be made better. However, I'm a slightly wary about the idea that improving community sentences will stop the use of short prison sentences. And I say that because when you talk to sentences, they say we only send people there who have to go to it. And the history of alternatives to custody is they become alternatives to each other. 
So I'm, I'm afraid I don't necessarily have solutions, just some questions for you. Thank you very much indeed, Carol. We'll now move on to a presentation by Blair. Thanks, Bob. Um, I want to take a step back and um, look at some of the basics in this debate. Why do we punish people at all? Well, I think there's an element of um, denying the, 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 the purpose and the usefulness of punishment, even in a modern and civilised society. So I thought it's important just to set this out. Nobody obviously likes receiving punishment, and nobody should take enjoyment in dispensing punishment. But I think it is a necessary evil in a, an effective and functioning criminal justice system. <coughs> Louise Casey, the Victims Commissioner, has talked about the way in which punishment has value, um, in that the state <coughs> is asking the victim of crime, sometimes the victim of a terrible crime, and their friends and relatives to step aside. And it does that in order that the criminal justice system instead can punish that person for the, the harm that they have caused. The alternative to punishment, well, we know what that is. It's vengeance, it's vigilantes, it's vendetta. And no society can function with that as an alternative. So the state takes responsibility for punishment, and rightly so. But I don't think this is a question either about being, if you like, more enlightened and more civilized. Um, depending on how much punishment we choose to use. It's interesting how America is often cited as one of the least civilized nations in the criminal justice world. Um, America um, makes less use of um, solitary confinement than Japan, for instance. Now, nobody, I think, commonly regards Japan as an uncivilized country. Japan, of course, still has the death penalty. So I think that's a kind of crude characterization we need to avoid in this debate. What do the public think about punishment? Um, we commissioned a poll of the public to uh, ask them their views of community sentences, the probation work that um, Carol's talked about. And we asked them what fundamentally they think the purpose of a community sentence should be. More than half, 51%, said it should make the offender pay back something to society. Um, a little over a fifth said it should punish the offender and deter crime. And then about 20% said it should rehabilitate the offender, and in that order. So I think we need to be clear that the public across all sections of society does regard punishment as an important part of a sentence. And punishment and payback, two quite closely linked concepts, do come before rehabilitation in their view. So I think we need punishment, and where possible we need rehabilitation too, but I think punishment always comes before rehabilitation because rehabilitation is only for those who can be rehabilitated. Um, and to some extent, rehabilitation depends on the offender choosing to leave behind um, a life of crime. It can only really work. However much crime victims want rehabilitation for offenders, however much probation officers and prison um, guards spend trying to rehabilitate offenders, that can only ever really work if the offender wants to change as well. And let's face it, some offenders um, don't want to change. Some offenders do. Some will want to change, just not yet. And for those who are engaged in crime, particularly as serious and organized crime, punishment, be it prison or any form of sanction, is an occupational hazard. For the time that they're committing crime, the prospect of punishment is just something they live with. And if they're imprisoned, then after their release, they can return to crime if they choose to or not. But it's ultimately their choice. Whether or not we spend much public money trying to reform them is, is dependent, I think, much more than we like to admit on where the offender is in their own life. Um, what's our problem? The problem is, and this goes to Carol's point, is we only really have one method of punishment in our criminal justice system. And there's only one method of punishment that the public regard as a punishment, and that's prison. This is the problem. We need punishment, but we don't have by any means a diverse and sophisticated range of punishment options available to sentences. We have something called community sentences, which we'll hear a lot about this evening, but I would advocate that these are not alternatives as a punishment. They may achieve other things and they may have reduced reconviction rates, but they're not in their current form a punishment. And until we have alternatives to prison, we'll be locked into a debate around whether we like prison or whether we should use it more or less, when in fact we should be talking about which punishments are appropriate. There will always be a place for prison, but we need more punishment options for sentences, not less. 
Thank you very much indeed. If we move on to Mark Johnson. Mark. You know, firstly, I'd like to say I'm not an academic or uh, policy maker, and uh, the only expertise I've got is over my own rehabilitation. Um, I would agree with uh, what, what Blair said uh, about punishment and reform. Um, the, the bar of the law is set that people commit crime out of the moral choice to do so, and it's been there for you know throughout history. Um, yet we've got you know overwhelming evidence to say that actually the people uh, it's ill-fitting, and the people that actually use it, um, it, it doesn't actually uh, meet their needs. Drugs, <coughs> alcohol, uh, mental health, personality disorders, etc. It doesn't. It doesn't cater for that. Um, it makes a strong emphasis on moral choice um, and not on illness. Um, so the politicians have set the agenda as well on, on um, the criminal justice as public protection, but it's set it at the most narrow point, <laughs> uh, and that is take, removing people from society and lock them, lock them behind a wall. And actually, I would, I would argue that that, would, that actually creates a problem in itself. Um, removal of responsibility, irresponsible people. It's a, you know, it's a, it's as simple as that. So more more harms done through uh, the perspective uh, uh, of the system. Incarceration, loss of liberty is a punishment, but there's so many other losses. Um, family, you know, um, personal sort of life, uh, and also, which is really the most important part for me personally as an ex-offender is a stigma the lifelong stigma which is like a life sentence by installments um you know want whether you, what you whatever you've done at 11 years old upwards will literally stay with you for mo most of your life in in some in some regards um so prisons the, the um pris incarceration is a punishment but there's so little opportunities for reform behind the walls <laughs> and um, um, the negligible services which, which aid uh, rehabilitation which are not much better outside in the community if from my perspective um, but the public are given the image of protecting the public reducing reoffending so the branding <coughs> is doing both but actually when you lift the lid you do one you know one's being done really well but the other side isn't and the, the real sort of uh, measurement of that are the reoffending rates um, so all offenders get box ticket exercises that don't consider the, the, the person's actual ability to change. I'll give you a sort of, uh, some antidotal evidence. I was recently in uh, uh, Wilmer Scrubs speaking to an offender. It was his 10th sentence, and he'd been in probably about 12 years of his life. And um, he was put on an IPP, um, so he was given a... He was basically a prolific and priority offender, and he was going to be sort of managed <coughs> when he gets out. So restrict his movements, restricted, and you know more not not sort of technically minded. And um, what what I found was shocking. He said, you know, I'm, he was really angry and resentful about this this um, his scenario and his situation, and um, about having to be managed. He said, I'm not a wrong one. You know, I I haven't. I, there's no victims to my crime. I burgle offices. Now, as an ex offender. I said, there's no such thing as a victimless crime, challenge. And his face went bright red, and he got really angry and even more resentful. And I said to, to the governor, what what's really worries me is we're in a situation now where this guy has spent 12 years of his life taking up public money and in a system, and he's not had one deluded belief that he's had about himself picked away at that. Not one challenge made of his, his delusion about how successful his life is and what he's living. And what's even more insane, we've got a group of people outside waiting for him to do the inevitable. I believe that change is possible as an individual if somebody's got the capacity to be honest with themselves. And that, that, the opportunity to reform is, I call it, talk about teachable moments. <laughs> You know, we all have when we get arrested, when there's been a knife crime perpetrated, when we, you know, the and, and it's and it's lost within the justice system of how long this systemic sort of process sort of takes place, and also when we when we're in, you know, when people go to prison, obviously as I've said, there's very little opportunities uh, to change or be challenged. Um, so from drug services to mental health to, you know, we all we all know that one. Um, so how can you punish somebody? who's already punishing themselves. 
who's already leading a punishing lifestyle? That's the question. Um, and when we're in a situation where we've got this huge disadvantaged group within society that find themselves in prison. Carter Report said it a couple of years ago, the same people experience poverty go to prison. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, just, it's as simple as that. And prison, especially around young people, is a better environment, a more stable environment. Often, they'll never admit this, because it's easier to say you're a bad boy than you're somebody with unmet needs. Um, that, um, that prisons are a better place than their environments that they come from. That's the situation that, that we're in. Um, so uh, I think uh, punishment ca can go against reform, um, the, the definition of the word, um, the argument about, you know, the, the way that we allow the, the sort of media to be involved in it um, and redefine what we term as vulnerable or rehabilitation. You know, we're, we've got the media saying rehabilitation is a soft option. Personally, it's the hardest option anybody could ever go through. To have every deluded belief that you've had about yourself peeled away and bashed out of you, quite in some cases, not that lovingly or kindly, um, but, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in, you know, they use that expression, tough love. So we know that a, a, a term of, we also know, and this is in the drug world, that a term, a term of um, confinement in the early stages of rehabilitation is proven to produce good outcomes. So incarceration is the best environment to start that period of rehabilitation. The other thing what I'll add is the cr criminal justice system is focused on outputs. So people who get locked up, delivery of successful drug rehab, mentoring programmes, someone getting into a job, but not outcome focused, and hopefully that will change within the new sort of agenda about people who don't reoffend. And I think when we set that as the as the, the end goal, uh, what we'll start to do is get a system that is user centric, <laughs> yeah, um, and off and off and also invite people who've used the system into critically reflect about services and feed those back into services, and that's when we'll start to get effective. Uh, punishments or, or rehabilitative programmes. Um, as I said, we must see this through the offender eyes and not allow this immediate frenzy to dictate uh, punishments and interventions. Um, how often do we see politicians disregard professional insights over what's popular in the news? That, need, that is a really big barrier to any kind of uh, success. Um, one more thing, community payback. Um, is seen by many who get sentenced to it as pointless. <laughs> um, and we've done a lot of work and research with the, with the, sort of, um, the MOJ around this with the people actually on the ground. So from painting a fence to smashing up videotapes in a probation basement, it's pointless. It can be used as absolutely a rehabilitation aid and it's not. So what actually kind of is there in the structure actually doesn't use or squeeze out everything that it could. The, the high vis vests, um, there's a Ipsos Murray public service, uh, public uh, opinion poll about what the public wanted to see about crime. I think we've, we've heard this before about um, the, the public wanted to see, some, see something being done about crime but they don't want to know the details. And Mr. Straw and his found wisdom invented the high vis vest. That's where that comes from, from that report. It doesn't come from science. And what I find the most worrying thing is where is the research around humiliation? Yeah? What, what does that cause in the people that have to actually wear it? Because when we're talking about protecting the public, that doesn't protect the public. That actually exacerbates a, a problem and creates a detachment from an already detached group of people. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, uh, we turn to Heather Munro for her opening statement. OK, well, I think what's become clear from everybody is this is actually quite a complex issue. It isn't just a matter of should we punish or reform offenders, because actually we've just heard that punish, uh, punishment, which we often think of as imprisonment, does have elements of reform and certainly from a probation perspective we often use imprisonment and recommend uh, custody because it does keep society safe there are some people who are very dangerous who should go to prison for control reasons not just punishment but it's about having some control and if they're in for a long time having a chance to have some work done with them in that setting to reform them 
Um, and for some, it can be a chance to have a bit of a respite from uh, for respite for society. So we use it often as a control element, not just punishment. Um, and as we've heard, for some people going to prison, as you said, drug offenders, it can be an opportunity to reform. So it isn't just straightforward punishment. Uh, you know, equals prison and community sentences is not punishment, it's reform. And I'll say a bit more about community sentences in a minute. Uh, I just want to say something about, because um, uh, Carol talked about effectiveness, and I do think this is a very important element of the debate, because surely an effective criminal justice system should not just take account of the purposes of whether we're punishing or reforming, but it should take account of the effectiveness of the different sentences. What will the outcomes be? And I think sentences don't have that information often in front of them. Uh, for this sort of offender going to this sort of sentence, what is the, uh, the effective rate? And we, they also don't have information about costs, and Carol's mentioned costs. And I think, you know, in the health service, we get quite, the, you know, there's quite grown up discussions about should we use this form of cancer treatment or not? We, and they take a Count of effectiveness versus cost. It does feel a bit like with criminal justice, we can't have a sensible debate that takes account of other issues. It has to be around, are we punishing or reforming? Um, and on the question of uh, that Blair was raising about uh, punishments, what society really wants, you know, I'm not so sure on that because, again, it depends what you ask. And if you ask victims what they want, what they say is, I do not want this to happen to somebody else. And that relates back to this idea of thinking about effectiveness. You know, it, it, their, their first immediate reaction isn't just punishment. They want to have an element of that, but the main drive is that they don't want this to happen to anybody else. Um, and uh, we heard there about this sort of the political push. And I think there has been, over recent years, there has been... Um, uh, with politicians having much more of a focus on, you know, the Tony Blair phrase was tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And I think what we saw was a lot more emphasis on tough on crime and a sort of upping the ante on who can be the toughest on crime and almost nobody daring to talk about the tough on the causes of crime. And I do think uh, that the balance uh, therefore swung too far. So we did start talking about punishment uh, more and more and relabeling as we've heard some of our sentences community service became community punishment and community payback and we started doing different things and took away many of the rehabilitative elements within that sentence um, I think it's also interesting when we talk about uh, uh, the fact that there's been less of a focus on tough on the causes of crime when we think about as we've heard who are actually in prison you know, do we really want to punish the mad and the sad? Um, and even the bad are usually bad because we've failed them in society. You know, people who, they're full of people who've been in care, which I think is a great euphemism, actually, for what we do with people when, they're, when they are looked after children. That's another bit of a euphemism, too, that they've changed the name to. So, um, and I don't know if anybody saw the Holloway programme that was on last year, which, you know, really showed some of the women that are in there for short term, you know, they, do we really want to punish them by locking them up? So I think it, there is that complexity about what we're doing to to people by saying we're punishing them and locking them up. And uh, finally, you know, we've talked, to, uh, I talked to earlier about how I think prison can have reformative elements in it. Um, for me, uh, I think we do need to focus on uh, community sentences, actually, the rehabilitative sentences do have a huge element of punishment in them. And it's almost like we're afraid to say that or talk about it. Um, they can be the most demanding and difficult sentences. Um, and Mark knows this from his experience of changing your behaviour, and I hope some of you will recognise this if you've ever tried to change your behaviour, you know, get fit, diet, cut down on alcohol. You know, it's actually very difficult to change behaviour. And you have to face up to a lot of things within yourself to do that. And it can be extremely painful. And that's the work we're doing often with offenders on community sentences. So I would argue that, you know, not only can prison uh, have reformative elements, but 
community sentences do have huge elements of punishment if you talk about the pain that's caused to people, but they're also extremely effective. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Heather, and thank you to all four speakers for uh, their particular inputs. Now, I know that uh, members of the audience will be uh, uh, eager to react to uh, these, co these uh, introductory statements in terms of the questions and comments that you want to put. And some people have already pre-submitted questions to us. So I wonder if we start with one or two questions from people who've um, submitted them to us, uh, starting with uh, Gemma Loosley. My question is, um, the full title of the recent Ministry of Justice Green Paper suggests that we can punish and rehabilitate at the same time. Is this possible, or are punishment and rehabilitation fundamentally opposed? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Blair? No, I don't think they are opposed. I think the best forms of <coughs> punishment also rehabilitate. Um, the evidence I'd, I'd, I'd cite for that was the... The study that, that we did looking at the reconviction rates for um, those on community sentences who receive different components. So if you're not aware, magistrates and, 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 and judges can uh, design these days a package of uh, requirements in a community sentence. So community service um, is now much more diverse and can have lots of elements, drug treatment, curfew, supervision, all sorts of different aspects. How do you work out whether the punishment element is having an effect or not? Well, the punishment element that we deem to be um, the clearest form of punishment was the unpaid work requirement, which is the community payback, the, the orange vest that um, Mark, talked about, Mark talked about earlier. The unpaid work requirements are now quite a major part of the community sentence regime, but they can be combined with other things as well. And when you look at the reconviction rates for supervision, which Heather will, will, will say is a, a requirement to attend um, probation meetings and, 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 and appointments with your probation officer, versus the reconviction rates for the same uh, category of offenders uh, of supervision plus unpaid work. And if you look at, for instance, curfew on its own versus curfew plus unpaid work, the additional punishment element, the unpaid work, results in much lower reconviction rates, over 10% lower, in fact. So in both cases, you've got examples there of uh, a community sentence, which is focused on rehabilitation, but a punishment element. And it's the punishment element which appears from the evidence to suggest that um, it can reduce reconviction. So you can have both. Have uh, Well, just on the issue of, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, unpaid work, uh, which is the actual requirement. Actually, what happen often happens is we recommend that for lower risk offenders. So it's of no surprise, actually, that the reconviction rates are lower for that group of offenders. So I think you have to, you know, dig down and look at some of the, the data differently. I think Blair said that, uh, uh, you know, most forms of punishment have a rehabilitative element. Well, I would argue, as I think I was saying, that most forms of rehabilitate, rehabilitation have a, a punishment element, and that's what we need to say more about. Mark? Look, I mean, it, it depends that, that the context of it, using the high vis vest, um, humiliation and sh subjecting people to humiliation and shame are in opposition to rehabilitation. <laughs> you know, that's a fact. I was recently I was on a community payback uh, with somebody who was a teacher, very low level crime, and he had to go to a school to do his community payback. It identified him in his local community, lost his job as a result. Do you know what I mean? Do you think he was that aided his rehabilitation? I don't. I don't think so. So it's you know subjecting people out in the community. It might fit the moral high ground of the people who make the law, you know, and it might, it might fit, but actually when we get down into the detail, the real expertise of, of helping people to change, it does the opposite, down to the profile, the psychological profile of prison guards to probation staff now have changed vast, vastly uh, from old style probation who are social work, multi-skilled, into silos. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and so that, that, for me, that all goes all against um, uh, rehabilitation. Carol. I don't think that they're inevitably in opposition, but I certainly think that the way we operationalise things at the moment puts them in opposition. Um, 
get, getting a, a sort of six months in custody, many weeks after you've committed the offence, um, not knowing with any degree of certainty whether you're uh, going to get that, um, and uh, the fact that that short period in custody causes additional damage. It doesn't just, uh, it isn't just the time inside, but the other things that you lose while being inside, which are sort of elements that I don't think most sentences would want to impose on people, like a loss of accommodation and employment, seem to me to be an unhelpful way of um, promoting rehabilitation. I think that it's possible to persuade people that you know, you've done wrong, we are going to punish you. But uh, as, as you would do with children, um, you may punish a child for doing something wrong, but actually one of the things that's most effective with children psychologically in terms of changing their behaviour is actually the bit where you, um, you bring them back. It's the, it's the absence of love that causes children to change their behaviour. It's the feeling that they're being re-accepted that is the thing that really changes their behaviour, the thing that they want to earn your trust and respect again. And in the same way, I think that um, we focus exclusively, um, and, and I don't think probation do this, but I think that the general debate focuses around what people have done wrong. Now, acknowledging what they've done wrong is the starting point, but when you want to change behaviour, focusing on what people can do and focusing on uh, how they can improve themselves seems to me to be a more useful way of progressing. And what, I, To give you an example, I was interviewing women who had used the Together Women project in uh, the north of England, and the thing that was most striking about them was that they didn't see themselves as being in control of their lives, and they didn't see themselves as worth investing in. And one of the things that that project really did was to say, you can take control of your life and we think enough of you to spend time with you trying to change your behaviour. And for some of them, that really was the very first time that anybody had spent that sort of time with them. And it seems to me that that might be a more positive way forward than constantly looking... You know, I'm not saying don't acknowledge the offence, but having acknowledged it, try and focus on some of the positive things that can help people to get out of the offence. Moving on to a further question from Neil French. Um, given that 75% of prisoners who are serving short sentences are reconvicted within two years, should we not abolish short sentences altogether? Mark. Uh, interesting. Mm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but, you know, as, as it's been quite... People have quite clearly said that short sentences are really problematic for a lot of people. Um, they don't give... Um, rehabilitation a, a chance to sort of take a hold but there is a <coughs> detachment within the community um, so you know f for me I I've met a lot of uh, drug users on short sentences a hell of a lot pesty sort of crimes you know what I mean to their local community um, nothing to worry you know shoplifting persistent shoplifting etc and um, any chance of getting a decent rehabilitation or even a link to an outside rehabilitation on release is just nobody can work with it with a, due to the high turnover. But I wouldn't say to increase sentences. And that's the thing, the thing that gets lost in translation or that pe caught people calling for longer sentences as a result of saying short sentences are ineffective where there's a lot of other options. Um, you know, for instance, a drug, co a drug court where people go to court, they've they're definitely got a drug problem and they're put straight into drug treatment. You know, for me, that, that's a more effective way to deal with it. Abolishing short-term sentences is a current campaign objective of a number of uh, uh, penal reform organisations, but I don't think it's really grounded in any sense of... Um, the political realities of a criminal justice system that has to deal with people. Um, abolish short-term sentences, and, and, then, and then what? So uh, you're a magistrate or a sentencer. You're, um, you're faced on a weekly basis with people who have, never mind committed crime before, they've received up to 10 community sentences. I think the average is actually nine. So replace the short-term sentence with a community sentence they've already gone through 
um, half a dozen or a dozen times already. So we'll claim that something doesn't work to replace it with something we know also doesn't work and the system will get better. Uh, it's quite apart from the fact that I don't think we should be in the business of fettering the sentencing options of, of our courts. If anything, we need to give them more options, not, not fewer options. Um, I, don't th I, th I think it's a campaign and a kind of policy without really any kind of thought to the consequences. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't support that at all. I think we need to do more to improve the sentences that precede prison, and that's why I'm so concerned about improving the punishment element in community sentences, because the truth is these are the sentences that precede the short-term prison sentence. Few people arrive in prison on a short sentence having never received a previous sentence or anything else. Carol. Um, the, the argument that probation hasn't, well, uh, com community service or unpaid work hasn't worked, um, a fine hasn't worked, probation hasn't worked, so let's send them to prison. What do we do then? Will we send them to prison again? What do we do then? Will we send them to prison again? And actually what you find is that sometimes it's the next go at probation that makes the difference to people. I'm not sure what the answer is to the question about re um, getting rid of uh, short-term prison sentences. I think you would have to get rid of sentences of less than a year for that to not just lead to uh, a, a sort of sentence drift up. Um, but I think more more helpful would be the idea of more community justice courts. I think one of the things that's quite problematic for magistrates is that, to some degree, their hands are tied when they get uh, people in front of them. And the, the problem-solving approach of community justice courts and, uh, and some drugs courts, where, where there's a bit of an opportunity to say, you know, what exactly should we tailor for this individual in front of us? Um, you know, should we take a bit of a gamble on this person, even though they've been into custody for more, you know, four previous times? That sort of, what are we going to do to keep the community safer, rather than, um, you know, he's been in custody before, so let's send him there again, which to some degree, I think, sentences feel a bit constrained by. Let's take three or four quick comments from members of the audience. Yes. Uh, John Thornhill, Chair of the Magistrates Association. I welcome this debate because it is right that we should be talking about are we punishing or are we re rehabilitating? And they're not mutually exclusive. I have concerns about some of the figures. Thank you, Blair, for correcting the figure about the stock. It's actually about 5 to 7% at any one time of those who are there on short-term custodial sentences. And of every 10 receptions, seven of those have already had a prison sentence. And we're dealing with some difficult problems. What do you do with the 32-year-old standing in front of you who has committed an act of violence against a public servant that caused serious injury, but the bench actually took a very brave view and said, we'll use a community penalty. She's now standing in front of you for breaching that penalty on three separate occasions. Now, it's all right saying we have no solutions, Carol. I think we've got to find those solutions. And that's the real issue. And magistrates will use the community penalties. We're using greater and more wider community penalties that are available at the moment. You talked about together Women's Project at Bradford, which I attended. Now, Blair, you're right. Within that, there is punishment. The ladies there have to attend five days a week to start with. Now, for many with the lifestyles, that is a form of punishment. That is challenging. That is difficult. And yet the funding for that project is being removed. So we have to look at the balance here. It is right that we would hope that within most sentences we achieve some form of punishment, but that we also receive some form of rehabilitation as well. And if those available programs are made more widely available to us. Again, Blair, you made that point. We need a wider range of programs. But the telling point was all three, or at least four, have said, let me correct, rehabilitation only works if the offender is willing to change. I think, Blair, you said that. And Mark, I think you said something similar. Change is possible if someone has the capacity to rehabilitate themselves. And we have to work with those programs. But I think we have to work with those programs at a very early stage. We need early intervention where we're tackling those issues and the underlying causes of the offending behaviour where society 
has failed them and don't leave the criminal justice system to clear up the mess that other elements of society have ignored. So comments on the comments, Heather? Okay, yes. Um, I, I, I just want to say something about breach and community sentences because I do actually think we can improve community sentences. We, you know, we do take a lot of people back to court for breach because we have to. We have no ability to make professional judgments anymore around this. When I joined the probation service, there was perhaps too much professional judgment, and I think it's actually swung uh, much more the other way. So now it's absolutely automatic we take people back for breach. So what we've become is an organisation that focuses on See, uh, on law enforcement and seeing breach as the outcome. You know, if we successfully breach something, that's a good outcome. I've spent the last five years trying to change the organisation around to say what we should be about is getting offenders to comply. And I just want to uh, go back to a point that Mark said, which is about asking offenders themselves. Because what we've done is designed a system of community censors that takes no account of what offenders themselves think about it. If we were a business, you would go to your customers and say, well, how can we improve our business? How can we be more successful? We have talked to offenders using user voice and saying, you know, how, how, what would help to make you comply with your orders? And it's very interesting because they say things like, well, actually, having somebody to talk to maybe uh, two weeks after my order's finished, if I could ring somebody up in the middle of the night or something when things are going wrong. And we've become so rigid and inflexible. So I think we can design better sentences if we have much more freedom to do that, that deliver on the outcomes and they're not specified in the way that they are. And I think we can do more about this in this uh, point of whether people are willing to change or not, because there is a lot of evidence about how you work with people to make them believe that they can change, because that's part of it. If people don't think they can ever reform, it's impossible for them. And that's part of the job I think probation can do, also working alongside ex-offenders and say, look, you could be like this person, and this is the journey. So I think there is more we can do to improve um, offending. And just one final point about the people coming back and back. Gad, go back to the point. It takes a long time, and you have to find the right point. And we mustn't say that uh, failures previously will necessarily mean there'll be a failure again, because there will be a tipping point in people's lives. And you know that's where I think probation can help to say this is the right time, and we need sentences who can believe that actually that might might work this time. Other, other comments? Yes, fine. I'm just interested in exploring the question of, of whether the courts actually need additional punishment options in order for offenders to, to face consequences for their crimes, or whether it's a bit more perhaps along the lines that you were suggesting, Mark, about making the existing options, in particular in the community, work better both to punish and reform or rehabilitate. So for instance, if you look at the options in the community order, many of them could be said to be punitive. So tagging and curfew, for instance, most people would probably think of as community, uh, punitive. Community payback is probably largely punitive, though one might say it combines both attendance centre requirements, exclusions, etc. And we shouldn't forget that the most commonly used punishment or sentence is still the fine, and that is, of course, you know, it might be said purely a punishment. So, so I'm just interested in how much it's about the, the courts needing additional punishment options and how much it's about making work better what's already there. Other comments? Yes. Yes, I was wondering whether we should treat very differently in terms of punishment and reform different kinds of offender. What I had in mind is that we might think differently about what we should do with a tax avoider, a heroin user, and a paedophile. Mark. The response to any of those issues. I'm at 40,000 feet at the moment. There are, um, yeah, what's interesting about what you said about using the system, what we've got actually more, and making it more effective, what I find interesting, especially around community payback, there's a project in, uh, I think it's New York, I'm not sure, I spoke to one of the people who run it, it's called the Blue Bucket, and it's, it's a community payback model, but it's a social enterprise, and you can get sentenced to it, 
but actually it, you can get go up into actually managing and running the business at the same time, so teaching skills. And uh, if there's any problem within your position in the organisation, you go back on this blue bucket, wheeling it around the streets of New York, cleaning cars and cleaning up the street. And it, the way that that's looked at, I think, is really interesting, because at the moment, community payback costs an awful lot of money. It, for me, it, it, by listening to the people who are actually at the sharp end, is pointless. And I think we need to really look at you know, those, the details, what you, what you, what you said there. Um, what, I, what I will mention... Uh, talking about projects, IAC, it will, it Intensive Alternatives to Custody, there's a project in Manchester which is having its funding pulled at the moment. And it it's, takes people, I think, on uh, two and a half, around the average two and a half year sentence, Mark. Um, and so quite fairly serious crime. And they use tagging at the first point, keep people on the short sort of lead until they start to comply and then relax it. But people go to this centre and it's a one-stop shop. It's a cent offender centric in its whole design. And that is, you walk in the door and everything you need, you can walk around the whole centre and everything's there. And they're having remarkable sort of success rates. And I think it costs, what, uh, £7,000 per head per year. Ridiculously low figure and is more effective. Why is it more effective? Because offenders are getting contact with people who actually can do something about their dilemma. That's, for me, the, the problem that we've got today is this systemic failure. You know, we design the criminal justice system, streamlined, business-like in its approach, when you've got a client group that actually need, you know, uh, more therapeutic and people-based centred intervention. Um, and that's, you know, it's, uh, community justice panels was mentioned, and that, I find that quite worrying. Uh, and I've spoke to people at the MOJOs about my concerns as well with that, because by... So by the design of the community justice panels, by default, it excludes some of the most important groups in the community to take part. So the people, one is, with the motivations to want to take part, your angry victim, do you know what I mean? With money, <laughs> do you know what I mean? In, in its design, those are the people that will take part. Now, I've said in columns, etc., that justice, for me, needs to be clinical, needs to be detached, do you know what I mean? And professional approach, and not having this frenzied, you know what I mean, public mob wanting to bash offenders over what they see is this, you know, they've committed crime out of the moral choice. I find that really worrying. And there's a lack of detail within that justice panel, like with restorative justice as well. It's kind of promoted rather than looked at, you know, in a, with a more scientific uh, approach to it. I'll give you another sort of antidote. In, interviewing a 14-year-old girl, it, I took her to a conference with me, and uh, one of the RJ people uh, said um, to her, you know, and what, what sentence did you get? And she said, I got restorative justice. And what was that? Well, I wrote a letter to my victim. And, and what did you think about that? She said, I thought, what about me? Who's, who said sorry to me? Do you know what I mean? And that, if you look at from her, sen if her mind's eye, yeah, that is just, it's not hit the mark. It's not done it. It's satisfied this high moral group of people, you know, with, with high morals that are satisfied that, yes, justice has been delivered. But to her, it's been meaningless. It's been a meaningless experience. And that, that's what I find worrying about when you take justice outside in the communities is actually the, the sort of science has got to be applied to it as well. Carol. Just on the point that Helen made about whether we need additional options, when... I'm sure nobody in the room is old enough to remember community service orders being introduced. Um, but when, the, when they were introduced, uh, they were introduced as an alternative to custody. And now they're regarded, unpaid work is regarded as one of the lowest options uh, in the community order. And I have this concern, when you talk to sentences, particularly magistrates, they talk in terms of offenders running out of road, of try, having tried everything else, and nothing is quite the same as custody. And I, so I think the alternatives you introduce tend to become alternatives to each other rather than alternatives to custody. Um, the one possible exception to that, I think, is the intensive alternative to custody pilot, which really does seem to have quite, quite a groundswell of support among sentences, which is, after all, I mean, much though public opinion is important, it's important because of the way 
it may influence the members of the public who become lay magistrates. But it's not an additional sentencing option, it's packaging the options of the community exactly. in a different and more intensive way. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. And, and I think that, that that sort of approach is more sensible than trying to look for a magic bullet. Blair. I, I agree with that. I don't think there is a, a magic bullet in terms of a new uh, sentencing um, option. But I do think we'd make a lot of headway if we <coughs> made our existing sentencing options, which purport to be about punishment, truly to be punishment. I think we've made some progress with um, unpaid work. And I think the visibility of unpaid work is important. And I think the type of work that is done now uh, tends to be better. But five or ten years ago, when it was first introduced, it was left pretty much up to local probation areas to decide what that unpaid work was. And I wonder how many people in the audience would regard working, sorting clothes in a charity shop, working in an animal rescue centre, uh, serving tea in luncheon clubs as punishment, because that's what punishment means in terms of unpaid work which is often done now. So my plea would be make the unpaid work requirement a true punishment in the way in which the public expect it to be. And if we look at what the public regard as punishment, they regard um, as work, manual work, outside in the community for a clear public benefit. Cleaning graffiti, clearing streets, clearing monuments, physical labour actually, it's old fashioned, but that's what the public expect as a punishment. Now, this does go to that issue which has been raised, which is that rehabilitation is hard. And if you're a drug addict or you're uh, addicted to alcohol, um, being ordered as part of your community sentence to undertake treatment for those things is difficult, right? But that doesn't mean it's a punishment. Right? Just because something is hard, getting up in the morning, if you've never had to do that, to attend a probation appointment at the set time every day of the week is hard, but that's not the punishment. And if we, if we think that that is the punishment, then we'll lose the public. And that's the, that's the risk here. We have, to, we have to see the right place for punishment in the system. But if we think that we're doing punishment when we're not, the public will look on this and think that it's a sham. And unfortunately, the, the current verdict of the public on community sentences is that they are weak. We know that they're poorly enforced. The third are not completed. So I think we do have to make headway, Helen, on, on improving the disposals we have at the moment. Um, but there are reasons why we don't impose fines anymore. I mean, we do impose a lot of fines, but much less as a proportion as th th than we used to. Why? Because we, we're not very good at collecting the fines. The Ministry of Justice has a billion pounds of outstanding fines uncollected. No wonder magistrates don't put much faith in them. So their options are there in theory, in practice, they have to do the best they can with what works. And I think we'd make a lot of headway if we focus on the punishment element of unpaid work being visible and being a clear punishment in the eyes of the public as they'd expect it. Heather. Uh, I think one of the problems is the public do not know what happens when somebody's on probation or on a community sentence. You know, we know now because of television, even if you, we even know what the, the um, the Crown Prosecution Service does because we see law and order. You know, we know what happens when people go to court. We know what happens when people go to prison. Do you really know what happens when somebody's on a community order? I don't think the public do. And I think it would be really good if people saw some of the, you know, the difficult people and dangerous people we work with as well, but work with very successfully to turn lives around. And the other thing is, of course, sentences to see the failures. You know, there are some great success stories, but getting to hear about those, I mean, Mark's a success story, and he's great because he can tell his story. You know, we need to hear more about those people who have, with support and help, managed to turn their lives around. And then people might have more faith, actually, as, a, as an alternative to custody. Well, we've heard from a number of people in the audience this evening, but, of course, the debate goes on and goes on and has been going on in another place, namely the Leicester Exchange's website. So, by way of rounding out the evening, I thought it reasonable to take one of the questions that a participant in the Leicester Exchange's website had placed. And I'm going to ask each of the panellists to, to give a quick view on this. Um, the uh, participant said, should we consider a complete overhaul of the criminal justice system, tailoring sentencing to the individual criminal rather than to the crime? Heather. 
Well, I think the current criminal justice system does do an element of that, actually, um, already. That's certainly what probation does when they uh, write a report for the court, where we do assess a whole range of factors. Um, I, 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 you know, in my heart of hearts, yes, I can see lots of reasons to overhaul the criminal justice system, but I don't think we're there. And I think what we've got to do is build on the best things of it. We need to learn more from other places about works well. We've heard some examples of what's worked in the in the states and other places. There are some very good examples elsewhere that I think we need to learn from. But I wouldn't be in favour of overhauling everything. Oh, I think I think um, it's a balance uh, b between the two, really. You know, so, uh, a sort of a, a business approach, but that's people centred. Um, I'd, I'd absolutely certainly agree with that, and about getting the right intervention at the right time, the, the teachable moment to, to the right people in crime. Yeah. Blair. I think that would be the wrong, the wrong approach. I think the criminal justice system imposes sanctions um, in response to rule breaking. And if you have um, sanctions applied solely on the basis of the needs, if you like, of the, the rule breaker, then the rules themselves start to become less clear to everyone else. And in the interest of order and, and civility, I think we need clear rules and clear laws that are commonly understood. But I do think we do pay attention at the moment anyway to the different types of offender that come through the door, especially if they're celebrities, uh, minor celebrities. Um, the members of parliament who uh, were punished for um, uh, fraud, I think, in, in certain cases, and the misuse of their expenses, they could have walked away with a fine. But I think it was quite telling that they didn't. I think the magistrates were you know, a product of their society and were aware of how high profile those crimes were and being members of parliament they had to have a sentence which reflected public um, displeasure with that particular offence by those particular people and so they went to prison. In, in New York, um, talk of the two Georges and Boy George uh, was a celebrity, much more embarrassing, much more effective as a punishment to have him do five days clearing the streets in Manhattan. George Michael in Hampstead, he got eight weeks in prison. I actually think in that case it would be much more humiliating for George Michael uh, within the existing sentencing framework to do exactly the kind of five days of community sentencing that was available in Manhattan. Of course, the magistrate was probably smart and knew that if they'd given George Michael unpaid work in London, he might have ended up in a charity shop, which wouldn't have been good for anyone. Cal. I don't think we need to radically reform our criminal justice system. I think we have to balance the public interest, the interests of victims and the interests of offenders. So I wouldn't actually argue for tailoring the system around the needs of offenders. What I would like to see is that the overall package, the overall level of a punishment is genuinely proportionate to the crime and then within that uh, there's an adjustment made for the particular needs of the offender. And I still think we're too, um, although the, the um, original Carter review talked in terms of trying to have a seamless sentence, it doesn't feel to me that in most cases, like we've got the different parts working properly together so that there is this element of recognising that an offence has been committed and that was wrong, but then that we move on and think about how we might change somebody's behaviour. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for this evening. Um, I'm sure you would like to join with me in thanking our speakers, uh, Carol Hederman, Blair Gibbs, Mark Johnson and Heather Munro for sharing their views with us. And I'd also like to thank all of you for participating in this uh, discussion and debate this evening. But remember, it doesn't end there because we've arranged things so that you can carry on exchanging your views at the Leicester Exchanges website that you can get on to through leicesterexchanges.com where this and other topics are very much live. And we hope very much that we shall see you at future events both here and in Leicester. Thank you very much indeed.